I was strolling through the uh, the internet, looking at websites, and all of a sudden I saw this article. It said that uh, Laker players were texting during a game. And then I saw the byline is by my good buddy, a uh, former uh, teammate of mine in college, Steve Bullpit, the uh, senior NBA columnist for Heavy.com. Spent a lot of years covering the Celtics for the Boston Herald. And uh, Bullpit joins us on the program. Steve, good to see you again. How did uh, how did you come about the texting on the bench with the Lakers? It wasn't on the bench, Daniel. It was uh, halftime. If you read the story, I'm not sure if you took the reading comprehension class at UV. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, seriously, it was it was at halftime, and um, you know, basically talking to a bunch of GMs and people around the league as you do regularly to, for the job, and this stuff started to come out, and it just really looks like it was a mess out there. Okay, but do we know who was texting? Uh, is LeBron in on this? It, it, it kind of felt like in the article you're talking about the the disrespect that not only, you know, the, it felt like the uh, front office had disrespect for Frank Vogel, that right. the players liked him, but here they are, you know, texting during halftime. Yeah. Well, I know at least, I know definitely one of the people who was texting, um, but it, uh, yeah, I can't say who it was, but yeah, definitely I know one. And that person said that uh, he wasn't, uh, according to the quote, wasn't the only MF or texting at the time. Cleaned it up for you, bud. But, you know, now, do you think stories are going to come out now because Vogel's gone and maybe there was more to what was going on behind the scenes? Well, actually, the, the story about the texting uh, was brought to me like a while back but we were developing, trying to develop it. Uh, but yeah, no, there was, this stuff was going on for a while. And, and I point out, this was, this incident, or, you know, uh, the incident that this points to, the, of the situation it points to, actually occurred when they were, you know, months ago, when they were still, you know, thought to be a team that, hey, this team's going to be good. And when it gets its stuff together. Um, so this wasn't one of these things like the last couple of weeks, you know, as uh, as the ship's taking on water. This was back when they were supposed to be good. You also mentioned that uh, Kurt Rambis would air out Frank Vogel in front of the team. How often was yeah. that happening? I'm not sure how often, but it was certainly, you know, it wasn't uncommon, um, as, as I was told. And again, this is something that's like, you know, you know the deal in the business. If, if someone tells you something, it's like, okay, do I trust this person? But then you've got to talk to other people as well. So, you know, hearing that from multiple people um, and everything in the in the story was, you know, uh, other people knew it as well. So it wasn't like a, 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 a quiet thing or something that was hidden. Why do you think there was a disconnect between Russell Westbrook and Frank Vogel? You know, I'm not sure. Um, but it, look, when you when you bring guys onto a team, um, they they can't be everything that they were perhaps individually. You know, let's look back at the 2007, 2008 Celtics when they bring uh, Ray Allen and Kevin Garnett to join Paul Pierce. Every one of them talked about what they were going to have to subjugate in their own game to make the whole thing work. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, you, you can look at it. And I seriously, the whole way along until it was clear that they were out of this thing, I thought if this uh, if this team gets healthy, they could be a, a problem for someone. But uh, they probably never had enough time healthy together. But uh, it just it just seemed like guys were trying to be who they were uh, individually or trying to get the, the their most out of themselves, figuring that would help the team best that way. And I don't think they ever latched on to an idea of what's going to be good for you know for the whole here. The ideal coach for the Lakers would be who, in your opinion? Uh, um, I, it's weird because I, I think the, the ideal coach has got to be someone that has some control with the front office because I think that's where the problems are stemming. Um, you know, you, you've got to create a roster that's going to work, not just like as someone pointed out in the story, you know, not just uh, rotisserie baseball here, rotisserie basketball. So, you know, um, I hesitate with some of the names that have been mentioned, but, um, you know, I, I, I think, I don't think any self-respecting coach would get anywhere near this 
until the problems upstairs are, are cleared out or cleared up. Yeah, but how are they going to be cleared up or cleared out? Well, um, so, I don't know. Someone's got to, if the, the coach you hire has some control there, that would help. Or if you bring in someone, um, you know, that uh, a stronger, a stronger GM that has an idea of, of team building, you know, or the people that are there all of a sudden change their tack and, you know, figure out like what's going to, what's going to make us here. Because if you, if you look at them now, Daniel, the, the, the contracts that you're weighed down with and the draft picks that you don't have that you can't use to as, as assets to, to spend in the market, that's a hard, situ hard situation to see anyone digging themselves out of. Phil Jackson's not walking through that door, is he? I, you know, I, I have too much respect for Phil's intelligence to, to think he'd do that. <laughs> well, he did go to the Knicks, Steve. Well, you know, someone throws a whole bag of money at you. <laughs> do you think that they would at least do a drive-by with Phil Jackson? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I'm sorry. Can I divert here for a second? It's funny you mentioned the term drive-by and Phil. There is this little dive bar out in Playa del Rey that uh, a close friend of mine who passed away, Frank Hamlin, was an assistant coach yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And a bunch of people would hang out at this place. It was a really small, you know, small bar. And uh, Phil lived nearby. And sometimes Phil would drive by the place on his way home slowly, make sure he got someone's attention in the window and flip the bird. And that was known in the bar as a Phil Jackson drive-by. Who's he flipping off? Just you know, as a joke, it was basically like, you know, <laughs> the people in the bar. So that was like, yeah, did Phil do a drive-by tonight? Yeah, there we go. So you mentioned Phil and drive-by. Yeah. I apologize for veering off uh, <laughs> uh, into Playa del Rey. It, uh, before I let you go, explain to me, Zion Williamson was the best player on the floor and not playing, doing 360s prior to the game. Why is he not playing? Oh. I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, you can do something for a few minutes, but can you do it long enough on a court to sustain? And should he be would, doing uh, 360s in front of people with cameras there? Because that just leads well, us to believe, like, why are you not playing? Well, you know, you used to pass the ball in warm-ups. That's for true. The Walton gang, but, but not but during the game. Not so during tell the game. me why that never. I know. Well, why throw it to somebody who wasn't as good a shooter as I was? I mean, that's really the philosophy that I had, Steve. My stock line was that uh, Dan had a three-to-one assist ratio, years to assist. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably piss off your, your staff there. You know how good Dan tells you he was? He was probably actually a little bit better than that. You carried us, bud. Yeah. Well... You know what? The only way to stop me, Steve, was with a handgun, and league rules frowned upon that. So just letting you know. Hey, yeah, we, did, we, didn't, we didn't have metal detectors at the field. <laughs> no, no, we, no, we did not. I was a gunner, absolutely, positively. Uh, yes, Paulie. Yeah, Dan, we don't get this opportunity that often. Steve, if you have any other stories that are passable for national radio or television, <laughs> bring them up. This is it. Uh, there are several. Um, yeah, no, they're... they're how about the one in Atlanta, Dan, where you were uh, uh, given a hard time to that intern at that party that night, calling that guy meat and stuff, and he went after you? No. I don't... You were calling some guy meat. Hey, meat. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you. I don't know who I, and it was somebody at CNN? Yeah. Um, and I was calling him meat. Hey, meat. I think it's probably like the takeoff of the of Bull Durham or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And we were at this party outside and this guy decided, so he was a large man, a uh, uh, younger man, and he decided uh, he'd, he'd had enough of that. <laughs> and uh, he started to come after you. And we were, you know, I grabbed the guy and pulled him against the side of the house. And, you know, you, know, you can't hurt the talent. I uh, explained that to him. <laughs> that it would be bad for his career. Uh, I think I mumbled that to him. But the next day or... Uh, the Celtics had played the Hawks that night. The next day we were flying to the next city and um, the trainer on, this is back when the Celtics were flying commercial, tell you how long ago it was. Uh, and the, uh, the trainer saw my hand, it was kind of gashed. And he go, he looked at it and uh, 
I think I was probably still buzz from the previous night, but he said I needed to get stitches when we got to the next city. <laughs> Thank you for taking one for the team. There you go, Daniel. Uh, great to see you, Bullpit. Thank you, and uh, good luck, buddy. You as well, sir. I hear you've done pretty well for yourself. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I'm starting to make a carving out a career here. You know? Slow. Proud of you, bud. Proud Thank of you. Thank you, Steve. Steve Bullpit, senior NBA columnist for Heavy.com, had the story.